If you hear noises coming from the crawl space, the sounds of beckoning whispers and scraping claws below your floorboards, it may not be the best idea to go and see what might be in there. My recommendation? Maybe it's time to move. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and I'm here to read to you some allegedly real stories of the unexplained sent to me from people all over the world. If you like what you hear, rate and follow Unexplained Encounters on Spotify and Apple, and stop by EerieCast.com for more creepy entertainment. Today's episode features monsters sneaking inside after dark, and a terrifying memory recalled during a nighttime visit. A quick warning though, one of these stories was interesting enough for me to include it, though it's not so unexplained. Enjoy and be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Demonic Tree from Gojo's Six Eyes I recall a childhood memory that really never left me, even after these last 15 years. For context, I was around eight or nine years old, and I was on a visit to my maternal grandmother's, one state away from the state I was born and raised in, Lagos, Nigeria. I had an aunt who lived with my grandmother that I was close to. I loved her even way more than my own mother, or at least just as equally at that age. My mother says that might be because when I was a baby, my aunt breastfed me when my mother was not home. So perhaps we bonded the same way between mother and child. I always followed her everywhere. So unsurprisingly, when she said she was going for an overnight church service, I said I wanted to follow her. So I came along. We arrived at the church around three hours earlier than the start time. Most people arrive early, which would be around 9 p.m., because the service started exactly at midnight, and no one wanted to be roaming around on their way to church that late. Plus, arriving early meant you'd get to find a nice spot to camp your overnight stuff, to sleep and have dinner. So my aunt and I got there around 9 p.m., settling and having dinner, and while she caught up with her fellow church members and friends, a lady spoke about the tree on the plot of land right next to the church. You see, the church had its own vegetable and herb garden, grown by the family that owns the place, and they got produce from there to make food for the congregation every Sunday after service. The lady said she heard rumors that the tree had succumbed its will. In my local language, the term for this is gbabodi, which basically means to accept a host and lose its own will or essence due to the influence of something else. The lady said she'd heard the tree had succumbed and that people were warned to not get close to it. Everyone sitting in the now semicircle shared their thoughts about it. Some believed that because the tree was right beside the church itself, whatever had taken over it should be gone by now, while others disagreed, arguing that it would take a deliberate action of blessing the tree to free it from whatever now inhabits it. A few hours later, church service started, and because it was such a hot day, the night was really cool, and all windows and doors were opened up to allow in some fresh air. Throughout the service, my eyes kept looking at the tree on the other plot of land beside the church. But it was so dark outside, and I couldn't see a single thing. It felt as if everything else outside the light in the church was now one with the pitch darkness of the night. And I simply just forgot about it and focused on the service. Around 5.30 a.m., the service was over, and everyone had begun to pack up and leave. My aunt grabbed our stuff in her left hand and my hand on her right. Then we left the church. We had just stepped out of the church grounds and had to pass by that tree we had discussed earlier, as it was along the road. Being right beside the church, it was literally impossible to avoid passing by the tree if you wanted to get to the main road towards the express. As we walked by it, that was when it happened. I kept looking at the tree as I walked along. Mind you, it was still dark, but not too dark that I couldn't focus on something and eventually see it better. As I stared, I began to see two slit cracks open on the bottom trunk of the tree, right in the middle, and two slit red glowing spots. They were like eyes, 
They even darted left and right so erratically. I froze in my tracks and absolutely could not believe what I was looking at. At first, I was thinking I had to be seeing things. But my aunt then did something that solidified and validated that I was indeed not crazy. She didn't say a single word. She didn't ask what was wrong. Instead, she suddenly yanked me forward and switched hands with me, switching me to her left and the things she was holding to her right. Then she leaned to the right a bit, yelling in a very annoyed tone. And what do you think you're looking at? It looked like she was saying it right to the tree. Without waiting for a response, still not saying a single thing to me, she forcibly dragged me and walked away so fast as I stumbled along trying to catch up to her pace. I was still in shock. The entire journey home was in absolute silence. She didn't say anything to me and didn't bring this up the next day or ever. I spent many nights having nightmares about that tree, but I couldn't even question whether or not I saw it. Because of my aunt's reaction, it was too obvious that what I saw was real. Her refusal to speak to me about it made it even more real. Looking back, I'm starting to believe that she may not have been aware that I saw it, which would mean that only she thought she saw it, because she never did look at me once when she yelled. So she may have seen it and immediately reacted, switching me from one hand to the other by instinct, then keeping the whole incident to herself to spare me from the horror. But I'll never know for sure. To this day, I doubt she would even talk about it if I brought it up. Pine Box Plantation From Just Another Creep Long ago in the pre-Civil War era, South Carolina's landscape was adorned with plantations of diverse sizes. My story involves a relatively humble plantation, facing economic challenges in the aftermath of the war. While grand plantations thrived, this one struggled to stay afloat. To adapt, a pivotal shift occurred, transforming from a rice plantation to fields rustling with pine trees. The once vibrant rice fields made way for a pine tree farm to meet the wartime demand for pine box coffins. Eventually, it was nicknamed the Pine Box Plantation. It, like many southern plantations, closed down. It was abandoned and succumbed to decay. Over the decades, whispers of otherworldly influence enveloped its closure, turning the old place into the town's local folklore a house that urged passers-by to hasten their pace. In my town, it became a repository of eerie tales, from phantom music and flickering lights to ghostly figures. These narratives ignited the curiosity of local youth, leading to dares and midnight misadventures. Since childhood, I was captivated by the campfire stories about this house, tales of a headless Confederate soldier patrolling on a full moon and the tragic death of the plantation owner's wife when she took her own life, when her screams echoed through the night. And yet, the funny part is that Pine Box Plantation's haunting label isn't rooted in tragedy. None of the deaths or battles ever occurred on the property itself. My grandfather, a no-nonsense man, once shared a unique perspective on the plantation with me. He said, I don't rightly believe in that sort of thing but I reckon that some places feel haunted. Not because bad things happen there, but because they attract bad things. Either way, I find that most things that fall in either category are best left to themselves. Well, as summer approached one year, my friends and I eagerly planned to explore Pine Box Plantation, fueled by our fascination with the supernatural. However, the town was thrust into chaos when our schoolmate, Tommy Green went missing. The mystery halted our plans as the town entered a lockdown. The streets were suddenly adorned with flyers featuring Tommy's smiling face beneath his green gator's hat. The adults were unnerved by the way he vanished without a trace. He was just in his yard one minute and gone the next. No sound, no witnesses, no Tommy. Months later, 
as we finally gained the freedom to spend a night together. We knew it was now or never. Yet, the challenge lay in navigating the thick overgrowth that had transformed the plantation's land into a massive pine forest. Sneaking out in the middle of the night and biking eight miles to the property were the easy parts. The real obstacle was the dense brush that rendered walking impossible. The only way to reach the property was by taking a boat through the sizable lake that bordered the back of the house. For this venture, we devised a plan, admittedly a bit foolish, yet a plan nonetheless. Armed with two canoes, courtesy of my buddy, we ingeniously affixed ropes to both the front and rear, strategically securing our bikes with one rider at the front left, another at the rear right. We embarked on our journey in this peculiar formation, surprisingly finding it manageable after mastering the art of compensating for the weight-induced leans. A few minor scuffs marked our path, but the real revelation hit us upon reaching the lake. My buddy had failed to mention that both canoes were designed for single occupants. The scenario unfolded as such. One man anchored in the seat, methodically orchestrating the rowing, while his companion straddled the back, clinging to the rower as if life itself depended on it, a desperate dance to avoid capsizing. Yet, like our earlier cycling expedition, once we got used to it, it was surprisingly manageable. Of course, the occasional plunge into the water added a splash of unpredictability. Even so, we still considered it an achievement. We slowly navigated our canoes to the lake shore, adjoined to the backyard of the plantation. We secured our boats by pulling them all the way out of the water and onto the yard to assure they weren't swept away. Then we all turned to just look at it. It was the first time any of us had seen it this close up before. There it was, resting within the towering pines, an ancient plantation house, frozen in time. Its once majestic facade weathered and wary. Ivy vines clung desperately to the weathered bricks, as if nature itself sought to reclaim what man had long forgotten. The creaking gate rusted and barely hanging on, whispered tales of its own, of forgotten elegance. As my gaze swept across the decaying grandeur, the surrounding pine forest cast long shadows, wrapping the estate in an eerie embrace. Wind rustled through pine needles, blending with the distant murmur of the lake. Windows, shattered by the passage of time, revealed secrets now exposed to the elements. From the porch where splintered floorboards protested each hesitant step, we got a better view. There was a breathtaking panorama of the expanse of lake. It was all enveloped in eerie silence. The plantation was now nothing more than a ghost, guarding its memories inside these dilapidated walls. Suddenly, a thundering bang came from somewhere inside the house. All of us jumped at once, locking eyes wordlessly. Now we were all terrified as well as exhausted, but there was no turning back now. We'd tried so hard to get here, and our time would not be wasted. We ventured into the house, which was easy given the absence of a door. The interior smelled of both mold and earth, and it was as dark as it was damp. It was stripped bare and hollow, devoid of furniture or any remnants of its former inhabitants. We wandered from room to room, basically aimlessly, looking for nothing but expecting something, I guess. The master bedroom was a big room, which held our attention for a moment, until we caught sight of an unexpected object. A coffin. A collective freeze overcame us as a haunting voice rose in my mind, one of curiosity and fear. We approached the coffin cautiously, our anxiety becoming bewilderment as we discovered the top, the lid, was missing, revealing an eerie interior harboring only an aged sleeping bag and a dingy pillow. We were confused by this. We were then drawn to another peculiar discovery, a pile of clothing ranging from old to new, most of it children's attire. The presence of a familiar green gator's hat jolted us backward. Tommy Green, that was his hat. While our stomachs sank at the realization, a scraping sound reverberated from outside the house, originating near the location of our abandoned canoes. We rushed outdoors 
entangled and stumbling with each other. We ran until we could see the lake shore and saw that our canoes had vanished without a trace. But we knew very well they couldn't have simply drifted away, not with how we secured them. Panic set in as we began to search for our missing canoes. I then suddenly caught sight of a lone tin boat, conspicuously nestled in the tree line beyond the lake shore. This confirmed to me that we were not alone. You might call me a less than stellar friend, but without hesitation, I plunged into the dark waters of the lake, determined to make it to my bike. The realization dawned swiftly on my friends afterwards, as I could hear them splashing into the water behind me. One, two, three of them, followed by a fourth splash, which sent my stomach plummeting and coiling into knots. Every stroke through the water felt like a desperate race against impending dread. Exerting every ounce of strength, I swam with a fervor that threatened to rupture my heart from my chest. I reached my bike and I clambered aboard, a silent prayer on my lips as I anxiously awaited my friends. Miraculously, one by one, they surfaced from the water, scrambling out and onto their bikes. We pedaled furiously as if outrunning the devil himself, racing back to my buddy's house, no longer caring if we got in trouble. We awoke my friend's parents, spilling everything. The coffin, the vanished canoes, the tin boat, and most crucially, Tommy's hat. The police combed the property meticulously, corroborating our account by uncovering the coffin, the boat, and the hat themselves. The authorities said it seemed like someone had been squatting on the property for quite a while. Yet, Tommy was never found. No arrests were made in connection to his inexplicable disappearance. To this day, his disappearance remains a mystery, as does the Pine Box Plantation. In the end, I learned that day that monsters are real, and perhaps so are the ghosts. Just because a place is called haunted, it doesn't mean it's haunted by the dead. Have you seen my bulls? From Hannah Liastis. My oldest friend Max was driving the old powder blue car along a winding road. The windows were rolled down, and it was a warm summer day. We were on our way to a camping site we'd chosen a few weeks back. A few years into college, we decided we were overdue for a camping adventure. Max and I go way back. We spent five years of high school in the same class, doing the same extracurricular activities, which mainly centered around volunteering and raising funds for a couple of charities our school partnered with. We'd had our highs and lows, but our honesty towards one another had been a precious help over the years. We were a mismatched pair. He liked cars, guns, planes, Elvis Presley, and working out. He was easygoing and funny. I was an artistic, introverted, animal-loving goth girl, with a big heart, a severe case of resting bee face, and a lot of anxiety. Our conversations were what kept us connected. We were smart, not to toot my own horn or anything. We tried to reinvent the world in a single car ride. I loved that about us. But the guy wearing aviator sunglasses driving that powder blue old car and singing along to blue suede shoes with the biggest smile I knew wasn't my boyfriend. He and I were friends. That had always been all our relationship was, and we were perfectly content that way. Two friends cruising along the highway, on their way to a camping site to spend a weekend having fun. After a two and a half hour ride, Max turned the car onto a rocky path that went right across a wheat field. There was a sign that announced the camping site ahead. He lowered the volume of the music as we reached the front desk of the camping site management. I handled the check-in, and we were given a map of the site to orient ourselves. The car crept along the little paths between camping sites, occupied by RVs. The canopy of trees made for some welcome shade for the inhabitants of this little temporary village. Dogs barked behind white picket fences, cats lazed around in hammocks, children ran around in their little yards, or zoomed past the car on their colorful bicycles. The air smelled of burning wood and smoking meats. I inhaled deeply, letting the fresh air reinvigorate me. 
We passed all the fancy RVs into a wilder section of the camping site, with nylon tents and picnic tables. There was still plenty of space, as well as connecting spots for electricity and running water. The site we were headed to was much deeper in the woods. At last, we reached it. It was just a very small clearing with the remnants of a fire still visible. Max killed the engine, and suddenly, we could hear the birds and a water source flowing nearby. I reveled in the silence. We exited the car, taking the time to pitch our tent. The sky was getting a bit grayer as time passed. Max got busy lighting a fire as I finished getting the cooler into the tent and setting up the space. We had brought dry firewood in case it rained. The weather forecast did mention a bit of rain for tomorrow, but we thought it wasn't worth canceling the trip over. We drank some beers, reinvented the world again, and went to bed quite quickly. It was so easy to sleep with the sounds of insects and toads in the flowing river. The first night was blissful, restful sleep. I'm an early riser, but not Max. I got up way before him, and knowing that I would, I'd brought a book to read. I grabbed my book, got out of the tent, and sank into my foldable camping chair, all wrapped up in a blanket. After a few pages, a family of four walked by our camping site, and I waved at them. I honestly thought we were alone, since we were so far out in the forest. We hadn't seen or heard anyone so far. A few hours later, Max woke up. He made coffee and we had a late breakfast. Then we decided to go horseback riding. I'm not sure how it works elsewhere, but here we have ranches who rent horses by the hour, and you get a guide who accompanies you on your trail ride. We booked a two hour long ride, and off we went with a local rancher out into the forest and along fields of grain and corn. I had more horse riding experience than Max, but he did hold his own. After about an hour on the trail, we came out of the forest, walking along a wide open field. We then spotted a man on horseback making his way towards us. The guide stopped, and so we did too. When the man arrived, he spoke to our guide. Hey, have you seen my bulls? Your bulls? Yeah, they broke out of the pasture. Now I got no clue where they are. They've got a bad attitude, and I gotta find them quick. Give me a call if you see them. Max and I looked at each other in disbelief. We were very much city folks. The idea that one would lose track of something as big as a bull, let alone two of them, was flabbergasting to us. The guide turned around and laughed, saying that he knew the other guy, and that he'd most likely find his bulls not too far from the property. We laughed it off and continued our ride. At the end of the ride, we thanked the rancher and headed back to the camping site. We elected to go for a swim in the nearby lake afterwards. We followed the indications on the paths to the lake, and sure enough, we found a beautiful crystal clear lake. We stayed there until we could tell that the sun was getting low, even behind the heavy clouds that had gathered above us. Hunger is what made us leave that enchanting sight. Max lit the fire again, but it started to rain. We decided to forget about the fire and just cozy up in the tent. Not having much to do, Max fell asleep rather quick. I was left to the pages of my book. I did mention that I suffer from anxiety, and I'm well aware that this may have played a role in what I'm about to describe but I'm also very much used to having to discern between what is real and what my anxiety is doing. Max was snoring lightly, and I was reading my book by the tiny light I'd brought with me. I could feel I was restless. It was hard for me to concentrate on the words, and I was tossing and turning. Finally, I gave up, shutting the tiny light off and frustratingly tossing my book away. I was hoping I could fall asleep in spite of my anxiety. I closed my eyes. Then I noticed there was no sound around us at all. The rain had almost stopped. Actually, there were some sounds, rustling leaves mainly. It was distant and faint. I felt my stomach tense. My mind was reeling with possibilities, and I was too afraid to move. I wanted to wake up Max, but I just couldn't muster the strength to take action. I'd never and have never to this day frozen in fear the same way I did that time. 
it seemed like my hearing became more sensitive. I concentrated so much on the sounds that it hurt my head. Rustling leaves, then rustling branches. A rhythm, too regular to be randomness of the wind, some sort of beat, but still too irregular to be human. Actually, if what I heard were people, there would not be only one. The thought of a bunch of strangers walking into our camp for some unknown purpose made my stomach cramp up painfully. I thought about waking Max up again, but my body still wouldn't respond. The noise became more distinct. Whatever was walking outside was getting close enough now that I could discern each step clearly. Those weren't people. This was an animal. Big. Heavy. I wasn't aware of any wildlife big enough to make this kind of sound in the region. Then my mind went blank again. I remembered the farmer earlier today. Have you seen my bulls? They have a bad attitude. I need to find them quick. I put my hand on my mouth to stop myself from screaming from fear once this realization hit me. Something was wrong. I couldn't hear the steps anymore. But it couldn't have left already without me hearing the sound of their hooves lumbering away. I strained my ears, trying to pick up the sound of the steps again. Every inch of my body was as tense as the strings on a violin. My heart was seconds from giving out. But no sound came. I hadn't moved a muscle. I removed my hand from my mouth. But as soon as I did, a very loud snort resounded right above my head, just outside the tent. We all know that sound, at least from movies. The sound a bull or a horse makes as it exhales forcefully through its nostrils. I thought my skeleton was going to burst from my skin and run away without me. I sat up and turned to face the direction of the sound. Something pushed at the fabric of the tent, seeming to test its resistance. A huge dark shape moved outside, walking along the tent wall, something still pushing against the fabric of the tent as it moved. I had managed to move and started shaking Max's leg as hard as I could. Max? 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 I hissed in a panicked whisper. He finally woke, oblivious to what was happening. What? He almost yelled. Shh. I seethed. What? He repeated, obviously annoyed. I could still hear whatever part of the animal was rubbing against the tent, and I saw that dark shape stop right beside Max. I stared at it with round eyes as another loud snort resounded. I whispered, There's a bull outside our tent. He didn't answer and after a few seconds, he resumed his light snoring. I couldn't believe it. In my panicked mind, I figured the bull would either show the bad temper the farmer mentioned by trampling the tent with us inside, or be spooked away if we made much noise, or it could result in the same outcome. I stared at the darkened tent wall, my mind conjuring images of a bull's hooves sinking into a man's chest or on a human head the weight of it crushing bones and flesh into mush. I became painfully aware of how vulnerable we were, how little protection the thin nylon canvas really offered us against any significant threat. Then blissfully, it simply walked away. I listened as the rhythmic noises died out in the night. Slowly, the buzzing and croaking sounds of the twilight hours came back, I could even hear the faint flow of water and the tiny drops of rain falling on the nylon of the tent. I realized then those noises likely never did stop. It's just my hypervigilance erased them to concentrate on a possible threat. As the adrenaline subsided, the whole thing appeared to me almost unreal. Had it really happened? Had I just psyched myself out in a panic? I was so tired by then. I lay back down, my head sinking into the cold pillow. I was drifting slowly to sleep when Max suddenly sat up and said loudly, Wait a minute, did you say there's a bull outside? Never mind, Max, just go to sleep. 
I convinced myself my anxiety had done a number on me, and I fell asleep. The next morning, it was raining again. It was just a light shower, but it was enough to make packing up miserable. Max asked me again about the bull event. I told him what had happened, but said I'd probably just had a panic attack. He knew I was prone to those, and so he didn't ask any more questions. We were putting the last things in the back of the old powder blue car, and I went to pick up the cooler, which we had set nearby while packing up. But I froze as I was picking it up. Our campsite was covered in grass. The rain had fallen all night and right there in the mud, close to where my head had been the night before, was a single two-digit hoof print. Too big for a deer. Too deep. I stared at it until Max called me over. To this day, Max has no idea about that hoof print. No idea that I did not, in fact, psych myself up into a panic attack. Because there was a bull outside our tent that night. A bull with a bad temper. As I said, I'm a city girl. I don't know exactly in how much danger we might have been, but I hope the farmer got those bulls back and away from the camping sites. It's been 13 years. I never did go back there. And I don't think I ever will. It crawled inside. From Real Jenny. The name of the road in this story has been changed for the sake of privacy. But keep in mind that this happened in rural Vermont. In the particular region of Vermont where I work, there have been stories and rumors going around years before this event happened in 2015. Folks talked about friends or neighbors who reported seeing things in the woods, near creeks or caves. Alleged sightings of pale, crawling things. They ended up calling them crawlers before the rash of sightings came to a sudden halt. Before long, the stories stopped, and people got on with their lives. These stories were just that to me. Stories. But now? I'm not so sure. Selling homes in our little town had always been relatively straightforward. But after the incident at the old Victorian property on Hollow Road a few years back, I started having second thoughts about my career. Even now when I drive past that house, a chill runs through me, remembering what I stumbled onto that night. I got my real estate license right out of college and joined a local agency. For over a decade, I enjoyed helping families find their perfect home. The job let me meet all kinds of people, and see inside historic places I never would have otherwise. Of course, occasionally an unusual circumstance would come up, but things never got too out of hand in our sleepy rural town. The strangest part of the job was usually just outdated decor, or the occasional mouse. That changed, however, with the Victorian place that came on the market in late 2015. The house itself was gorgeous, a four-bedroom historic home with beautiful ornate trimmings inside and out. But its location was decidedly remote. At the end of a winding wooded road, 20 minutes outside town, the property backed right up to a state wildlife preserve full of hiking trails. Pretty, but isolated. Nonetheless, I was excited when a married couple in their 30s contacted me after seeing the listing online. They wanted a peaceful place out in nature where they could start a family. I scheduled a showing that weekend. On the day of the showing, I met the couple at the house in the late afternoon. We did a full tour of the home and grounds. The wife loved the Victorian charm, while the husband was already envisioning converting the attic into a man cave. They were seriously considering making an offer. After about an hour showing the property, dusk was falling, and the couple had to get to an appointment in town. In our rush, I forgot to double-check that the back door was fully closed and latched. Normally, it wouldn't have bothered me too much, but my boss had recently started doing spot checks on our listings, so I knew if he found it unlocked, I'd be in trouble. As I drove away, the thought of facing his wrath gnawed at me. I debated just letting it go overnight, but a few minutes later, my professional conscience got the better of me. I turned around and headed back. By now it was pitch dark on Hollow Road, except for my headlights showing narrow ruts through the woods. I felt uneasy pulling up the dirt driveway. The house loomed like a shadow against the trees. 
Still, I got out and did what I needed to do. First, I checked the front door to make sure it was locked. It was. I then headed around back. I sighed when I saw it. The back door was ajar. I cursed myself for nearly getting myself in trouble with the boss, or worse, risking animals or vagrants getting inside. Before locking up, I first went inside and gave the main floor a quick look around. Everything appeared fine until I went back to the back door. Someone had dragged dirt inside. That wasn't there during the showing earlier, and I wondered if I had brought it in just now myself. Then a strange smell hit me. Rotten meat and musk. My stomach sank. My first thought was an animal really had gotten in here somewhere, and that kind of smell would destroy any chance of selling the place. Panicking, I searched each room, but found nothing. That's when I realized the stench came from the basement door. I slowly opened the door and flicked on the light that hung above the steps, leading downstairs. I called out a feeble, Hello? But the only reply was creaking under my feet as I steadily descended. Reaching the dirt floor, the light from the stairs revealed dusty boxes, but the smell was overpowering. I searched the nearby wall for a light switch, but I didn't find it. I then remembered the basement floor didn't have its own light fixture. So, I pulled my phone out and tapped on its flashlight. I swept my light around slowly. In the far corner, it landed on a door I hadn't noticed before. The stench originated there. Every ounce of me wanted to flee, but I had to look inside. I walked quietly over, trying my best to hide my presence from any possible animals or intruders. I flung the door open and flashed the light in. What I saw made my blood turn to ice, because I saw it immediately. A silhouette like a frail, bony old man hunched low to the ground in the crawl space. It reacted instantly, scurrying backwards and relinquishing a hiss like a wild cat. Instinctively, I nearly moved my phone's light in the direction of the figure, but instinct took hold. I froze. Something very old and deep inside my head told me that I would quickly regret shining the light directly on this now-cornered, humanoid thing. And, believe me, this creature was not human even if it was shaped like one. Its head was too long and thin, as were its arms and legs, and the ribs that poked through its chest looked distorted. The ribs were too jagged and numerous. Bulbous eyes sat below a bald, earless head. From its elongated face, it stared at me and emitted an unnatural, almost human whimper. The sound sent instinctive chills throughout my body. I backed away. I ran upstairs and fled outside. Once outside, I turned and stared out the still open back door. I figured if I locked it now, that creature would be trapped inside. But would that be a good idea or a bad one? I didn't know. So, leapt forward and shut it rapidly. I drove off in shock, unsure what to do. I stopped at the closest gas station, got a cold brew coffee, then dialed animal control. They were able to send a couple of guys over in a truck within the hour. I waited in my car at that gas station until they called back. They didn't find any wild animals, even in the crawl space in the basement. However, before ending the call, they asked how long the window by the back door had been broken. Apparently, the thing had broken through the window to escape. I reported all of this to my boss the next day, who then ordered a replacement window the same day. The house was sold to the couple that I'd shown the house to that day not long afterward. Even so, I did get quite a talking to. My boss was infuriated with me leaving the back door open. After all, that thing would not have gotten inside if I had remembered to lock the back door. I beat myself up over this from time to time. Because of my forgetfulness, I'm left with a very chilling memory. I've wondered many times since if I should have done more to address that vile creature. But exposing its existence may have just invited more harm. Maybe some evils in the lonely woods are better left undisturbed in their secrecy. If we trespass on their ancient grounds, only suffering will follow. Sasquatch is Real From Shroomer 
This story was shared with me from someone else. I first heard the story about 10 years back, but the actual account happened long before its telling. I live on Vancouver Island, a small island located in the Pacific Ocean, just off mainland Canada, just a stone's throw across the border of Washington State. My longtime girlfriend of the time was First Nations, having been raised on the far west coast of Vancouver Island here in British Columbia. We decided to take a small vacation, to spend a relaxing weekend in the small coastal town of Tofino, found on the far west coast of the island. I have many stories about working, living, and the strange encounters I have experienced there, helping to fuel my natural curiosity towards that area. But this story has always stuck with me. At the end of this vacation, we were headed back to our home on the eastern side, and while driving through Cathedral Grove, one of the old growth forests left on the island, my girlfriend suggested we stop into the major town of Port Alberni while passing through. She wanted to stop and see her uncle's family, who she hadn't seen in years, since they had all moved from the coastal village inland. I agreed, and after another hour worth of driving in darkness, by 8 p.m., we found ourselves parked just outside their humble home, just on the outskirts of the small port town. I'd never met these relatives before, but on the trip there, my girlfriend had proceeded to give me the rundown on her uncle and aunt. After much conversation, it had come to my attention that her uncle was the blood hereditary chieftain of the tiny village in which she was raised. We walked into their rustic kitchen, which could be entered from the back door of the house, to see her aunt Kathy quaintly baking cookies for our arrival. She had already removed them from the oven, placing them onto a cooling rack she began to introduce herself while ushering us to sit down at the dinner table. After a brief introduction, we had come to discover that none of my girlfriend's cousins were at home at the time. They were away at a basketball tournament, leaving only her and Arthur there. After some talking between the two, Kathy stood up and loaded a handful of cookies onto a small plate. With an inviting smile while placing the plate into my hands, she asked if I could take the plate of cookies down the hallway to the living room where Arthur was sitting, watching TV. The two women began discussing about the local community powwow and turned their attention from me, which was my cue to exit. I clutched the circular plate of cookies and walked down the extended dark hallway that led to the large living room that could be entered from the home's front door. Nervously, I tightly gripped the plate of cookies, then proceeded to casually enter the open living space. There, in the far side of the room, sat Uncle Arthur, very silent and stoic, watching the news on the TV from his dark brown lounging chair. He possessed strong features and tired eyes on a hardened exterior, a man who had not only seen many things, but lived them as well. I came quietly into the room, sitting the plate of cookies onto the burl wood table, which lay in between his lounger chair and the couch. I proceeded to introduce myself to him, he asked if I would mind taking a seat at the end of the couch next to him, so we could speak. I agreed and sat on the couch seat directly next to the large lounger. He began to ask me many questions about myself, as well as to where we had just come from on our vacation to stop by their place. I explained we had wanted to take a small vacation on the coast of the island to see the village where my girlfriend had grown up. We then had a wonderful conversation covering many topics associated with the small village, where he had been chief for many years. Insightful discussions about raising kids, the local wildlife, the region itself, and much more. He seemed to relish the chance to share much of the small village's quiet history with me, as well as the time in which the family had resided there. Time passed quickly in enjoyment, until after a particular conversation we were having about the mountain trail which we hiked when we were at the village a few days prior. Arthur quickly went silent, as his look of enjoyment in the conversation changed suddenly into one of stoic silence, like the one he possessed when I'd first walked in. I was completely puzzled by the quick 180 degree turn in his attitude, wondering if I had said something out of line, something that may have offended him, he then raised the television remote up to the TV, switching it off. The sound of the crackling fire was the only sound left to be heard as we sat in silence. 
At this point, I was stumped as to what had occurred to cause this silent tension. He leaned forward in his chair, then rubbed his strong chin. His eyes returned to mine where he sternly asked me, Did she take you up the forest trail? The one that goes to the Red Rock? He was referring to an area close to the village, along the river, where a monstrous red stone boulder extended off the top of a small cliff face, overlooking the flowing river that the children used to play on in the hot summer months. I thought through my memories, and I was correct that we had indeed hiked that exact trail through the heavy forested terrain up to the stone in question. Arthur shook his head in a slow accepting motion as he let out a deep sigh. He paused for a moment, then leaned forward close to me. Do you plan on going there again? He boldly asked. I wasn't sure of how to answer, as I wasn't sure of the context of his questions or the tone in which the conversation had quickly flipped to. I then told him that I indeed had planned on coming back for a similar vacation, as the surfing and fishing in the area was great. Plus, the nostalgia alone for my girlfriend returning to the village with her childhood memories made the trip all worth it. He took a moment of silence before beginning to speak once more. I can tell your heart is true. You respect the earth, and that you are good to my niece. I want you to be extremely careful when going into the mountains by way of the river, especially at night. He spoke as he sat back in his chair, removing the armed forces ball cap from his head and giving the thinning hair in his scalp a jostle. At this point, I was stone silent and completely stunned toward what he had just said to me and to the idea of what could possibly follow up his last remark. It is my duty as chief to give you my blessing in returning to that trail, to walk it freely without harm and to allow you safe passage from the Seishak. If you have respect for them and their home, they will mean you no harm. I was completely hooked on his every word and found myself needing more clear answers, asking him as to what exactly a say shock was. Arthur then explained to me that in rough translation of the language, say shock meant wild man in his native tongue. He said they were a small group of humanoid creatures that stood bipedally with large feet standing around seven to nine feet tall. They're covered from head to foot, almost entirely in hair. I personally better knew them by the name of Sasquatch. Chieftains through the history of the tribe would pass the story down, speaking about the existence of these forest protectors. They were said to be covered in a thick mat of brown or sandy-colored fur, depending on age and gender of the creature in question. It's supposed to act as camouflage against the thick forest, allowing them to pass unseen even right in front of the naked eye. They would leave tracks so large, frogs could seek shelter in rain puddles found within after the rain. Arthur sat forward in his chair, looking at me with seriousness, then asked, Do you believe in what I've told you? I didn't believe in any of it myself. That was when I was a kid, and my grandfather and father used to tell me the story. I accepted it as fact because of our culture, but in the back of my mind it did leave a questioning in myself to some capacity about its existence. That was until one October night, when I went up that same mountain trail to Red Rock, following the river to catch the migrating salmon during the autumn spawning run. He explained that on one night of spearfishing, he had taken the river trail much farther than Red Rock, the moon was full, making night fishing and following the path farther into the dark woods that much easier as he walked farther than he normally would. I followed the river until I finally stopped when the river reached a 120 degree bend, causing the speed of the water to rapidly change through the rocks to a much slower pace. I began fishing and I fished into the night, catching enough fish for my family and the neighbors I've always loved spearfishing, standing in the thigh-high current, 
watching the reflection of the large moon against the surface, feeling the cool water slowly flowing past me, reflecting on my own personal journey. He cleared his throat and went on, telling me about how, around two in the morning, he noticed an eerie hush falling across the mountains, something he had never experienced before. He said it was like the entire mountain and forest began to hold its breath, with him waist deep in the water. Then something caught my eye, drawing my attention to the heavy woods that stood on the higher elevated plateau to my north-northwest, approximately 30 yards away. I could see some reflected eye shine, bright yellow-greenish, coming from the darkness of the grove. These eyes were staring directly at me, not moving a single muscle after rustling the large cedar branches. Had it not been for the large moon that night, and the couple of hours given my eyes to adapt to the night, I would have never even known it was there. I stood in the river, my body colder than the water itself, as I started to steady my own breathing, lowering the fishing spear in my hands towards my waist. I continued to watch as I began to focus in on the details of the figure that stood hidden amidst the shadows. I could tell the figure was staring directly at me, with a soft greenish eye shine allowing the true focus of the creature to be known. I could feel the unnerving sensation the animal projected towards me as I stared into its eyes, until I fully lowered the fishing spear into the moving current and I lowered my entire body down into the flowing river. I stayed in that cold water, watching the figure move in my direction along the raised plateau. I could then see more of it as it came within 20 yards of me, never making a sound as it moved. I could tell it was a Seishak, just like my father and grandfather had told me about. Now it was standing only about 15 yards away, blending into the row of large cedar trees that lined the bank of the river. The thing stood about 9 to 10 feet tall, and could be easily missed among the trunks of further trees with its dark and textured fur. As I stared in disbelief, my entire body shaking in the moving river. Looking back on the incident, I'm sure it had been near this spot, as the area was a place where bears would normally hunt for salmon during the day, with the slowing of the current. I remained still for what seemed to be hours in the cold river, watching the large beast constantly scan up and down the river, trying to locate my presence, all the while cautiously creeping forward. My body was shaking and becoming increasingly more cold as I was witnessing the truth in the words my forefathers spoke of. That creature just above me cemented my elders' words deeply within me in a time when I questioned my culture most. The wind began to blow a strong breeze from the tidal current that proceeded to carry my scent, causing the creature to quickly turn away from me and disappear into the darkness of the heavy tree cover. I quickly got back up, clutching my spear so tight, my hand trembling, I was sure I was close to hypothermia at that point. I took a moment even still to leave some fish on the riverbank as an offering, and I quickly hurried back towards the village. That's when the howling began. These blood-curdling screams that still haunt me to this day. They echoed through the hills from the other creatures that I'd failed to even see. I trekked as fast as I could down the river path and never went back that way ever since for any reason. I was speechless when Arthur finished speaking. I had no words for the man who wore the seriousness of the story so boldly on his face. He broke silence and continued. The say shock is out there, unseen and always watching. So be careful going out there and proceed with only love in your heart for Mother Nature. Respect the forest with its guardians and you will be granted safety. Don't take this story lightly. The Seishok is out there, watching everything. 
and if you're in its home, you are the same as any creature abiding to the laws of nature. Suddenly, a heavy knock frightened me as I quickly flipped my head to the doorway beside me to see my girlfriend and her auntie. Arthur, are you bothering our guest? Kathy asked with her arms crossed and a smile on her face as my girlfriend stood behind her, explaining it was time to get back on the road. Arthur answered, No, and flicked the TV back on with the remote. Standing up, I extended my hand out to shake goodbye, thanking my host for his time, for the food and the words. Arthur stood up, only to pull me in for a hug instead and patting me on the back. He spoke into my ear, which will stay with me for as long as I live. He simply said, Never forget they're out there, always watching. I thanked Aunt Kathy for the lovely visit to the couple's home, and I said goodbye. We then departed, making our way back home. Since that day, I've met countless others within the various tribal communities, which are located up and down the island through many events, all of which have their fair number of locals who often share stories about the population of Sasquatch that call the island forests home. After the many years with my now fiancé, I've seen, heard, and been part of countless Sasquatch experiences, adding my own voice to the many who have had the luck, experience, or spirituality to come across one of these forest guardians. Thanks for listening to my story, and may you all find what it is that you seek. And remember, Sasquatch is real. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at EerieCast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks. Add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at EerieCast.com plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.